have your Bibles with you, if you'll be turning in your Bibles to Exodus, the 15th chapter, we're going to see the basis of the name that we're looking at tonight, Jehovah Rapha. And Jehovah Rapha uh, is, simply means God heals, or the God who heals. And so we're going to look at this from where the name occurs, as well as its implications, and then how it carries over into our understanding of the person of Jesus and His ministry, and then how it carries into the doctrine that some have put forth that states that healing is actually something that was included in the work on the cross. It's called healing and the atonement. And so we'll, we're going to look at all of these, but let's start with Exodus chapter 15. And if you look, you'll see the story is, uh, and we're not going to go through the whole story. The whole story is, is, is the story where they come to the bitter waters of Mara, and uh, they were murmuring, and, and they came to, verse 23, they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter, and therefore the name of the place was called Mara, which means bitterness. The people complained, what shall we drink? He cried to the Lord. God said to throw a tree into the water, and it would make the waters sweet. And as we look together, and you can see in verse 26, and he said, if you diligently heed the voice, well, let me just back up and read 25 and 26 together. So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Verse 26, and this is written on your, on your handout. And said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments, and keep all of His statutes, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. I am Jehovah Rapha. And this is where the name comes from. Again, it's, it's only used this one place and this one time. It's used to describe, again, a, a, an aspect of God. But as we, as we look at this, I think it's very important that you see this as a promise that He's made. And many have taken the promise to the extent that saying, and because He made this promise to Israel as part of their deliverance, that He would put none of the diseases that He put on Egypt upon them, Therefore, we have a similar promise. Well, if you look at the statement that I have right underneath the verse, it says, The statement is not a promise based on deliverance, but rather based on the condition of their obedience to God. And this is made clear through the reversal of that statement. And if you'll turn over now to Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm just going to walk you through some of this. You will hear a lot of TV preachers that will preach... Exodus 15, 26, but they won't dare touch Deuteronomy 28. Because Deuteronomy 28 actually speaks of just the opposite of what Exodus 15 does. Why? Because this was a promise made on the condition of obedience. In fact, as you look at, at chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, it begins with a similar kind of assertion. It shall come to pass if you diligently, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. And because you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be in the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds. This is the basis of which many, many groups talk about prosperity. Read down a little bit further to verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, and that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Same thing He said in the first one, only in just the opposite. 
Cursed you shall be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be your basket of your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. In fact, almost the rest of this chapter is devoted to how God will deal harshly with His people if they do not obey Him. As you read through this, this whole chapter of 20, I'm not going to do that for you. I want to rush down because it is such a very long chapter. Just turn over to verse 58. Because in verse, beginning at verse 58, and this is what I've also written on your handout. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. What does verse 59 say? Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, He will bring back on you all the, all the diseases of Egypt, and of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed." Now, does that sound like a promise of automatic healing to you? Or is that not God's word to Israel as a condition that He says, if you go in this direction, these are the things I'll do. If you go in this direction, this is what you have to expect. And so, whereas many groups have looked at even, and we're going we're to talk about this, the Christian life as a parallel to Israel and how God dealt with Israel, the promise He made in Exodus 15, 26 was not automatic. That's all I want you to understand at this point. It was not automatic that because He delivered them from Egypt, He was not going to put any of the diseases of Egypt upon them. It was not automatic. And so as such, what we have is the question, is there healing in the atonement? How many of you have ever heard that expression before? Healing in the atonement. Maybe not. Okay. I can guarantee you that your uh, Assembly of God brethren and friends and your Pentecostal friends, uh, they, they not only understand it, they preach it. And this is one of the foundations of their faith. That healing in the atonement is something that, that is... Well, that's why there's so much emphasis in their preaching and in their practices on healing. What is healing in the atonement basically? Well, I think we can all come to agree that, that Jesus died for our sin, can't we? No objection there, is there? In addition to sin, they would like to nail your sickness to the cross. So that when Jesus died, the same blood that cleansed you of your sin cleanses you of all sickness. That's the teaching. Oh, and there are other groups that go even a step further. He died for your poverty too. So that not only is your sin nailed to the cross, your sickness and poverty has been nailed to the cross. And as such, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive not only forgiveness of sin, you, for, you receive healing of sickness and deliverance of poverty. That is the basic tenet of their teaching. And that is what is referred to as healing in the atonement. Let me just read what I've got written. The activity of God in the area of healing is a most controversial one in that the issue of disease or sickness is often related to the issue of sin so that the same salvation that secured deliverance from sin equally delivers the believer from sickness. Now I'm going to stop myself right here because I want to say something. I should have said this at the very, very beginning. I want to make sure you are absolutely clear. Brother Randy, are you saying God doesn't heal? No. Listen. God heals. God heals divinely. God heals miraculously. The question at, at this junction tonight is, does He always heal? And is He bound by His covenant with us 
on the cross, with Jesus on the cross, to heal. And is my faith in Christ, which forgives my sin, <clears throat> well, let me just jump to the is it, is it jump to the chase? No, that's that, all right? Cut to the chase. Let me just cut to the chase. I won't cut, to, I won't jump to it, I'll cut to it. Let me cut to the, a lot of people have a problem when they don't get healed. And many people leave their faith behind because ultimately they're thinking, if I haven't got enough faith to get healed, what makes me think I've got enough faith to get saved? That's why this is a dangerous doctrine. It puts the doubt in the believer that if you're not experiencing a healing, there's something wrong with you. Either a lack of faith or a sin that's keeping you from getting this. And that's because the teaching is, it's, all, it's automatic. You should get it. And if you don't get it, there's something wrong with your side of the connection. Next week... I'm going to continue. This is going to be a two-parter. You'll notice it says Jehovah Rapha part one. Next week, we're going to look at the question, what are the purposes of sickness? Is there a purpose for sickness? Does God use sickness? And what are the means of healing? How does God heal? Does He always do it miraculously? And then, what happens if He doesn't? What does that say about my spirituality? Am I less spiritual if I am not healed? Those are the questions we'll look at next week. But going back to this, is there healing in the atonement? I, I, I say that it, the, it's tied to their belief that the salvations that secure deliverance from sin equally delivers the believer from sickness. This is referred to as healing in the atonement. In addition to this, the healing ministry of Jesus is considered a standard practice of Christ which is to be regarded as the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus healed when He was here. He heals now, and you should expect it. When these two concepts are coupled with spiritual gifts of healing spoken by Paul in 1 Corinthians, there's a strong doctrine, especially among charismatic groups, of divine healing that is formulated and proclaimed as part of their gospel, and that's the problem. When it becomes part of the gospel, if you believe in Jesus Christ, not only will you be forgiven, but you will be healed of anything that, that comes upon you. Because God will not lay upon you any of the diseases that He laid upon the Egyptians. Healing becomes a focal point in determining the degree of one's faith. It becomes the examination for sin in one's soul. And it becomes the activity of Satan in one's life. Do you remember when the disciples came to Jesus and asked Him a question? He says, who, was, who sinned? that this man was born blind? Him or his parents? And the answer was neither one. There was a purpose for this man's blindness and it didn't have anything to do with sin. It didn't have anything to do with the activity of Satan. In fact, what did Jesus say it had to do with? That you might see the glory of God today. So we need to realize that it denies God's purpose for sickness. And bottom line, it intimidates any believer that does not receive his or her healing. So, it, so and, and if you probably have seen this in different, different camps and different, different programs, it begins to incorporate questionable practices on how to receive your divine healing. Uh, how many of you remember uh, prayer cloths? How many of you remember some token that if you will pay and you get one of these from the, from the healer, that whatever you pray becomes yours? I remember one time I was, there was a guy who was based out of Jackson. He came down to Savannah when I was uh, pastoring in Clifton. I went out to Savannah to hear him. And uh, he gave out little one-inch square pieces of uh, burlap. He said, I have wrapped myself in sackcloth and prayed for you. And if you will take this as your point of contact, then whatever you pray for, your healing, it will come. Now, interesting, it came to me in the mail after I had filled out a prayer request. So this little square inch came to me in the mail. And there was a number at the top of my letter that was my, evidently, what number person I was that received these letters. 
and it was somewhere in the 10,000s. So I just calculated, if I was the last one that got a piece of this burlap, if he cut it into one inch squares, and I was the last one, and I took the number of those squares, and I said, if this is, you know, what he has sent out, <clears throat> he wrapped himself in three miles of burlap in order for me to have a point of contact with him. That's what I'm saying when I say questionable practices for receiving of divine healing. Finally, the teaching rests on two separate and distinct New Testament passages that quote from Isaiah 53. An examination of these three passages helps to correct the error in his thinking. So turn now to the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at the Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah that so many will point to as the basis and the foundation for healing in the church. The passage is uh, the 12 verses of Isaiah 53, the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. There's 12 verses. And in these 12 verses, they're divided into three sections. This is what I've outlined on your handout for you. The first, sec the first section is, is just verse 1, where it says, uh, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The first section is just the question, How will we know the Messiah when He comes? How will we know the Messiah when He comes? The second session is, section is to give us a description of the Messiah when He comes. And those are verses 2 through 4. He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see Him, there's no beauty that we should desire Him. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and rejected. We did not esteem Him. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now I want you to note, take careful note of verse 5. Verse 5 begins with a conjunction. Verses 2 through 4 answer the question, how will we know Him when He comes? Verse 5 enters into a, a totally different section. And if you turn over your sheet, you'll see what I'm referring to. What was the reason for His sacrifice? You say, well, why do you start that in verse 5? Because of the word, but. That's how verse 5 begins. It's a conjunction. It, it changes. He's going through one chain of thought and he's telling you what, how we will know him when he comes. And this is how we know. When he comes, this is what he'll be like. But, why did he come? What was the reason for his coming? What is the reason for his sacrifice? And beginning at verse 5, you'll read, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By His stripes we are healed. Now, you read through the rest of this from verse, from verse 6, 6 through 12, and you will find, as, as I have outlined for you, starting at verse 6, the Lord hath laid on Him the what? What's the word? The iniquity of us all. Verse 8, for the what? Transgression of my people was He stricken. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul a suffering for what? Verse 11, by knowledge shall my righteous servant do what? Justify many. Verse 11 again, why? He shall bear their what? Verse 12, he bear the what? Sin of many. Verse 12 again, He made intercession for the who? Do you see that from verses 6 to 12, there is no other mention of disease? You say, well, why was it mentioned in verse 5 then? I'm about to show you. I'm about to show you because we take verse 5 as to be really even a cornerstone. By His stripes we are healed. We pull that one part of the verse out Let's look at it in its context. This is what we talked about when we talked about how to study the Word of God, right? Let's study the context. What are we looking at in this section? We're looking at the reasons for His sacrifice. Let's look at verse 5. He was what? Wounded for our what? He was bruised for our what? 
the chastisement of our what? And by His stripes we are... Now, here's what I need you to understand. that <clears throat> The Hebrew language uses a form of poetry to say the same thing in two ways. It's called parallelism. So let's look at this verse again. Wounded corresponds with bruised. You see that? Transgressions corresponds with iniquities. It's just saying the same thing two different ways. Let's go to the next part of the verse. The chastisement, and what was the chastisement? That wasn't his crucifixion. What, what happened before his crucifixion? He was beaten. He was whipped. He was scourged. That was his chastisement. The chastisement of our what? Peace was upon him. So that by his stripes, and chastisement corresponds to stripes, what does peace correspond to? Do you see what I'm saying? You've heard this preached before. I'm showing you why it's preached this way. Isaiah 53, 5, when he says, by his stripes we are healed, he's talking about spiritual healing. He's talking about making peace with God. It is the only place in the entire chapter where healing is even mentioned. And it doesn't mean physical healing. It means spiritual healing. It is equated with the peace that we get with God. We got peace with God because He took our punishment. We got peace with God, which is like being healed of a sin-sick soul. Because they whipped Him. By His stripes we are healed does not refer to healing in a physical manner. It refers to healing in a spiritual manner. The context of Isaiah 53, 4 is the description of the Messiah, where He comes. When He comes, according to Isaiah, the Messiah will be involved with disease and suffering. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I, I've jumped ahead. The context of Isaiah 53 indicates that surely He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. That relates to how we will recognize Him. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, that's because we haven't asked ourselves the question. When did He carry our griefs? bore our griefs and carry our sorrows. Or as Second Peter, 1 Peter 2 will say, when did he bear our sickness and carry our diseases? We'll come to that in just a moment. But the basis of that understanding is that in Isaiah 53, it was how will we know him when he comes? How will we know him when he comes? Well, one of the things he'll do is He will bear our griefs and carry our sorrows, or bear our sickness and carry our diseases. Uh, my friend John brought me a copy today of the Septuagint. And when Matthew writes his passage out, in Matthew, as we'll look at in just a second, in Matthew chapter 8, he used the Septuagint, which took the words where we have in Hebrew for grief and sorrow, Septuagint had sickness and disease. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a changing of the words. It's not saying, well, Isaiah didn't even mention sickness and disease. The words incorporated in it. So it's not a problem with recognizing that Isaiah says grief and sorrow. Matthew says sickness and disease. That's not a conflict and that's not a contradiction. The words were allowable because the words were interchangeable as in the Greek, that's how they were presented. But we'll get to a moment and say, ask ourselves the question, when did this happen? When did He bear our griefs and carry our sorrows? I'm sharing with you at this point that surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows relates to how we will recognize the Messiah when He comes. And we'll see that in just a moment. By His stripes you were, we were healed refers to the spiritual condition of man and the atoning work of Christ to bring peace, which Isaiah equates with healing between us and God. You say, but, but that verse is in the New Testament. Yes, and we'll look at that and in its context. These meanings were understood by the New Testament writers and their use 
of these passages reflected that understanding. Now turn to the New Testament. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 8th chapter. In Matthew chapter 8, as you can imagine, is very early in the ministry of Jesus. Shortly after the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount is 5, 6, and 7. After the Sermon on the Mount, we come to chapter 8. I don't know if your Bible has headings that gives you a, a kind of an outline of what takes place. But when we ask the questions, He bore our sickness and carried our diseases, the important question is when. When did He bear our sickness and carry our diseases? Normally we want to say, just because of the terminologies used, bore and carried, we want to say on the cross. We want to say, well, He bore our sin on the cross. He bore our sickness on the cross. And that's where they get their, 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 their thinking. That's where they get their understanding. But look at Matthew 8 with me. As I've already indicated, the context of Isaiah 53 is the description of the Messiah when He comes. And according to Isaiah, the Messiah will be in, involved in disease and suffering. The Hebrew, Greek, and sorrows allows for disease. That's not, a, not in question. I've already mentioned that. In other words, He would be involved in a ministry of healing. And the prophecy is directed at His life, not at His death. Look with me, Matthew 8. If you have subheadings in your Bible, you can see this. In the first four verses, he cleanses a leper. You see that? In verses 5 through 13, he heals the centurion's servant. You see that? In verses 14 and 15, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. You see that? In verse 16, this is important, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed how many? All who were sick. Matthew chapter 8 is a, a depiction of the healing ministry of Jesus. How will we know him when he comes? He will carry our, our sickness and, bury our, uh, and carry our diseases. Well, how do we know that? Look at the next verse, verse 17. And I want to ask you this question as you do. <clears throat> when the Bible says that it might be fulfilled, when is that prophecy being fulfilled? At that moment. When Matthew tells us that he was born in Bethlehem and then says that it might be fulfilled, when was the prophecy being fulfilled? When he was being born in Bethlehem when it talks about uh, the king's coming or, or any of the other things, Matthew takes about 25 times to tell his readers, this is the Messiah. We know this because the Old Testament has told us this is what we need to look for. So now he says in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And I ask you the question, when did he do that? When he healed, in his healing ministry, in other words, in his life, not in his death. He didn't bear our sickness on the cross. He bore our sickness in himself when he was among us and was healing among us. It was not a part of the atonement. It was a part of the ministry that answers the question, how will we know him when he comes? What did John the Baptist ask? Are you the one who is supposed to come, or do we look for another? And Jesus told the, the, the messengers of John, you go back and tell John. What did he tell the messengers to say? The blind see. What else? The lame walk. You tell John, I'm healing. And that should answer his question of whether or not I was the one who was to come. He bore our sickness and carried our diseases while He was in His ministry, in His life. Isaiah spoke concerning how we would know the Messiah when He came, and Matthew used that very passage to identify Christ as the Messiah because of His healing ministry. Neither Isaiah nor Matthew had the death of Christ in mind. 
And the context in both Isaiah and Matthew bears that out. Christ's healing ministry was one of the many signs that He fulfilled to demonstrate He was the Messiah. And so when we read this in the New Testament, He bore our sickness and carried our diseases. He didn't do that on the cross, folks. He did that when He walked the streets of Galilee and Caesarea and Capernaum. When He healed the blind, made the lame to walk, the mute to speak. When He showed that the compassion of God was to, to, to touch people's lives, they said, is this not the Son of God? You remember the blind man? The Pharisees tried to tell him, oh, you don't want to follow. He's a sinner. And he says, I don't know if this man's a sinner or not. All I know is this. Once I was blind, now I see. And now I'm going to follow the one who made me see. That's why he healed. The other passage that is used as a cornerstone, and, and, and if you'll talk to some of these folks, talk to your friends, talk to your other... Uh, and, and it's okay that they're your friends. Please, you know, don't, don't hear me saying don't hang out with them. But when you talk to them, you will hear them talk about healing with these two verses as though they were wedded together and it fell in one place in the New Testament. Surely He bore our sickness and carried our diseases and by His stripes we are healed. And you will hear that as a, almost like a single statement. Well, where is that second part, by His stripes we are healed, in the New Testament? Well, it's found in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. So let's look over now to 1 Peter chapter 2. What we are doing tonight is studying the Scriptures in their context of where these verses are found so that we can properly interpret them for how the writer wrote them and what he had in mind when he wrote them instead of forging them together and reading into them something that isn't there. 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, <clears throat> let's look at the context of 1 Peter chapter 2. By the way, and we've been preaching on Peter for a couple of weeks now, or at least one week, and then I went to Branson and I got to see him on stage. <laughs> and then I preached on him again last week. One of the things I have told you over and over since we started talking about Peter is that I love Peter because he changes. And the way that he was allowing God to change him made him a whole different Peter than what you read in the Gospels when you read these two letters of his. He's a whole different Peter. And right now, he's, a, he's, he's doing a couple of things. He's trying to help churches... First of all, undergo persecution. He does that more in his second epistle. But he's also, like James, trying to help uh, churches to behave like churches. He starts out the chapter by telling them how to live the Christian life. Lay aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy. We've been, and we talked about this passage as well, uh, desiring the, the pure milk of the Word. And then he talks about how Jesus was the cornerstone, but he was rejected. Peter's about to preach a sermon. And the reason I know he's about to preach a sermon is that he quotes from the Old Testament four times. And in this passage, he's not just writing a letter, he's preaching a sermon. Well, what's his sermon about? Well, it starts out by talking about uh, Jesus being the, uh, the, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. And then he tells them, in beginning at verse 13, that they should uh, uh, submit to the government. Well, that's probably not popular to talk about tonight. So we'll just move right on. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to push that that button tonight. But the context of the passage and looking at your notes, let me just share with you from your notes. The context of the passage speaks of Christian conduct verses 1 through 12, not the gospel, not how to get saved, but how to act saved. And it is an introduction 
instruction to the church of how to live the Christian life, not how to be saved. And the instructions in chapter 2 speak much about, guess what? Suffering. He talks about submitting to the government, and then look at verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh ones. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief doing what? Suffering wrongfully. That's going to be his sermon theme. He's going to have a sermon theme about how to suffer wrongfully. What credit is it if you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer it, you take it patiently? This is commendable before God. And then in verse 21, he actually then makes this transition, and he wants us to know that uh, if we're to follow an example, it needs to be an example of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also did what? Suffered for us. Leaving us what? An example. That you should do what? Follow His steps. Now as a result, this is His sermon. He's now about to use the life of Jesus to illustrate what He's been telling them to do to be willing to suffer wrongfully. This is part of the persecution that they, the church was going to be undergoing. And He was trying to help them and saying, You're not going through anything new, guys. Jesus, first of all, was the cornerstone. He was rejected. Don't you think you're something on, uh, on a platform? <laughs> or as I said the other morning, by the way, if you heard me say that, know that I got it from, from Tony Evans, that, that you're, you're something in a bag of chips. <laughs> I just think that's a great, great little expression. When you think you're something in a bag of chips, okay. So he says, don't think, don't be surprised when you start going through suffering. Jesus went through it. He was called to be our example. And then look at verse 22. Verse 22 is actually a prophecy. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. We'll, we'll just, and, and I know that because in my Bible it's set off as though it were a prophecy. I mean, as though it came, had an Old Testament reference. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our what? Sins. Say anything about sickness there? No. Who himself bore our sins upon the tree. Don't lose sight of that. <clears throat> And then, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Why does he say that there at that particular point? He's just talked about how he bore our sins upon the cross, upon the tree. Well, we go back to Isaiah 53 and we find that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And now he's saying... By His stripes we are healed. What's He saying? Listen carefully. Just as the death and suffering of Jesus Christ produced a blessing for us, our suffering can be turned to a blessing for others. And God can use the suffering that we go through. And that's what Peter is actually preaching about. He said, be, be ready to endure suffering wrongfully. Why? Because Jesus did. He's our example. And if He suffered wrongfully and peace came out of it, guess what? We can suffer and others can be blessed. And so He goes on, and we'll, we'll see this in just a moment. We'll keep... Let me just keep going and then we'll come back to it. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I've got you down in the, in the sheet and, and we're on the last page now. You turn it over, you're going to see who committed no sin. All of this is what we've just read. The teaching is to suffer as Christ did to be a blessing to others. That's what I just said. But now turn it over and look at this. Peter quotes Isaiah 53 four times. You see this? 
In verse 22, who did no sin, neither was deceit found in his, his mouth, is a quote of Isaiah 53, 9. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, is a quote from Isaiah 53, 7. Who, by his stripes you were healed, is a, is a quote from Isaiah 53, 5. And all we, like sheep, have gone astray, is a quote from Isaiah 53, 6. Peter is preaching a sermon about suffering, not telling believers that they have now access to healing. Does that make sense? We see the passage in its context. We see it in, its, in, in not only how Peter in, was using it, but even how he quoted Isaiah and how Isaiah was using it. We see he properly quoted Isaiah. He didn't take Isaiah out of context. Isaiah said, how, uh, why, why did he come? He came so that he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and all the other things that we read in those other uh, 8 to 12 verses that talk about his uh, uh, dying for our sins. But that when he said the chastisement of our peace was upon him, Peter says, I'm using that. Because just as Christ's suffering resulted in peace, our suffering can result in peace. And that's the teaching. For those who would pull it out and make it something else, I, I put down here, just read with me at the, as we close out, because i got two minutes. Hey, this is going to work. Each verse needs to be interpreted first according to how Isaiah used it, and that's what we did. We have established that Isaiah's usage of healed refers to spiritual healing of our relationship to God or peace. It did not carry the idea of physical disease. Peter is teaching in his letter about the suffering of the believers in this world and how Christ suffered unjustly also, and we need to be ready to suffer. That's what he's saying to us, and that's a message for today, folks. We need to be ready to suffer. Peter is speaking more of the stripes than of the healing. Let that, let that sink in a minute. Peter is speaking more of the stripes than he is of the healing. The healing is the peace that Isaiah spoke of. Just as the suffering of Christ benefited us, our suffering can be a blessing to others. You don't have to worry about whether or not you can remember what Brother Randy said. This is why I wrote it out in two full pages. So that you can have it to look over again or share with somebody else. What's the conclusion? The conclusion for tonight is simply that I just wanted to be able to con communicate to you that the scriptures used by other groups, and I'll say that again, by other groups, the scriptures used to teach by other groups, healing in the atonement are not interpreted correctly in light of of their own context. Although God does heal, and I'll say that again, yes, God heals. Does God heal? Yes, God heals. Did God heal you? He probably did. You probably have a testimony of God's healing. I do. I later called it remission. But when I went to the mission field, it was... We were in Costa Rica in language school, and I was bent over with arthritis. And I remember going to the doctor and saying to the doctor, what do I need to do? And he says, uh, well, you probably need to go to somewhere like Arizona where they got dry heat. And I said, well, I wasn't called to Arizona. I was called to southern Honduras. And he said, southern Honduras? Well, well that'll work. And what God's call on my life was, at that time when we were in language school, was to slow me down. This guy knows when I ran on, on, four, on, on all eight cylinders all the time. And I just needed to be slowed down. And then there came a point, after we got to Honduras, that I went into complete remission. I remember... And I remember when it was, because it was when my brother died in 1996. And I remember going to the States for his funeral and forgetting to take my medication with me. But I didn't have any issues 
and the whole time I was there, I didn't have any issues. And I came back, and Cindy says, you forgot your medication. I said, yeah, I know, but you know what? I'm not hurting. I'm not going to take it right now. And I didn't for the next six or seven years. And when we got back here, the symptoms started to come back again. My m quarterly trips to the arthritis clinic now are always positive. I'm doing great. And I'll be between you and me and whoever's watching. <laughs> I could probably go off my medication and not even experience any problems. But as we will discover next week, one of the ways that God heals is through medication and His, His ways. And those who would drop their meds and say, I'm only trusting God, well, when you come Sunday morning and we talk about the, the Good Samaritan, let me remind you that he poured in oil and wine into his wounds, not symbolically, but medicinally. And I can share with you a whole lot of places where medicine is not anathema to God's will for your, for your condition. So, we'll look at that next week. I'm, I'm getting off track. God does heal according to His sovereign will. But healing is not a part of the salvation experience automatically. We must always pray for the will of God. And to add healing to the work of the cross, well, that's to preach a different gospel, folks. When you want to talk about anathema. You want to be careful about preaching something and calling it the gospel when it isn't. It sets... And we'll talk about this next week. It sets up many for bitter, bitter disillusionment and sometimes abandonment of their faith because it didn't work. They didn't get healed. And they were told, it's your fault. It's your fault. You don't have enough faith. Or you've got a sin in your life that you're not confessing. And God's, God's having to... because. God never deals in sickness, they will say. Come back next week. We'll, 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 we'll open up that can of worms. That's why I believe there's a danger to this doctrine. 